thanks so much for being a part of our worship service. And I understand that there were actually a couple portals to guide you into our service today. So hopefully we're all together as we worship God. And on this weekend that we celebrate our freedom as Americans, we have expressed our hearts to God, declaring even greater the freedom that we share together through Jesus Christ. And so let's pray together as we give thanks to God for removing the sentence of condemnation and giving us the righteousness, the innocence of his one and only son. Let's pray together. Father, you are the just and the righteous and the holy God who has not only, as Alex shared earlier, refused to negotiate on your standard, but you have made it possible for us to be declared right and innocent and holy before you through the shed blood of your Son, Jesus, the Lamb of God. And Father, we thank you for the freedom that we have in being able to worship you even as we gather together with our family and friends. And we thank you that even as we worship you freely within our nation, it's with an even greater freedom that we experience in Jesus Christ, that the old is gone and the new is here. And so, Father, we pray that you would revive and refresh and rejuvenate our hearts with a vision of you and how you participate even with joy in our worship experience. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So the days, they look different, but they're actually, they are all huge. It's that day when your family and friends pause their calendars and they gather together with you and they celebrate the day of your birth. It's that day when you step onto a brand new campus, it could be this coming September or even August, and you step up to an entirely new level of education, of opportunities, of classmates and teachers, and it's a day that you've been looking forward to and it finally arrives. It's the day that you jump into your car or you board a plane for that long-awaited summer vacation. And it's a day that you have been waiting for and maybe have even postponed that you were originally going to take during the spring break holiday. It's the day that you say goodbye to someone that you love very deeply. And it's a hard day because that person has meant so much to you. And yet what carries you through that day is knowing that you will be forever with that brother or sister, that family member with Jesus for all eternity. And it might be that day that you look forward to when we gather together again here in the sanctuary at Bread of Life Church. And for all of us together, we are so looking forward to that day when we will worship God together, physically present, even physically distant, but celebrating our faith together as his people. It could be an event. It might be a passage. It could be a Bible study. It could be some of you are enrolled in our kids' fellowship on Friday nights. It might be a message that you hear that that day God opens your minds and blows away your hearts and changes your life forever because you go deep further in your understanding of what it means to be a follower of Christ. You see, the days, they all look different, but they're all monumental. The days are massive in terms of their importance and their significance and their weight in your life. And as the biblical prophets, those men who spoke for God, as they talk about the future, there's one particular messenger of God, this mouthpiece whose name probably means the Lord hides or the Lord is hidden. Speaking of how God reveals his purpose and his will through his servant, that this one particular messenger of God develops the theme that some days are more important than others. In fact, throughout his short prophecy of three chapters, he describes it simply as the day of the Lord. 
that the day of the Lord are those days that will look different for different people, and yet they are cosmically, globally, spiritually revolutionary and massive in importance. In fact, in the opening chapter of his prophecy, he commands that we say nothing, that we actually be silent before the day of the Lord. And to be silent before the day of the Lord is an expression of humility and submission and readiness for God to act on his behalf. To show that he is righteous and just and good, to protect the godly, to judge the wicked. And God speaks to us through this messenger of his to help us to understand that some days, not only in my life and yours, but in God's work in the world, are sometimes more important and more strategically critical than others because they advance the working of his purposes. They established the massiveness of his kingdom. They help remind us and the whole world, in fact, all of creation, to know that he is the Lord Almighty, the God who is all-powerful, the God who intervenes for his people and acts on his own behalf. And speaking for God at the same time as the prophet Jeremiah, we heard about Jeremiah's lamentation last weekend. Speaking in the same generation as Jeremiah the prophet with the southern kingdom of Judah as his audience, the divine mouthpiece details what happens on the day of the Lord and why it matters to us. In fact, there are two writers, Andrew Hill and John Walton, who live outside of Chicago. And if, you, if you're mom or dad or even if you wanted to buy a book that gives you a glimpse of the Old Testament, they've written a wonderful book called a survey of the Old Testament. And they describe the day of the Lord. In the day of the Lord, justice is done. This is a positive time for those who have been victims, but a day of reckoning for those who have been oppressors. And they go on to say that it has political, social, spiritual, and cosmic ramifications and can include a reversal or restructuring of any number of conditions. That the day of the Lord is a day of justice, a positive time for those who have been victims, but also a day of reckoning for those who have been oppressors. The day of the Lord gets us ready for eternity in his presence. God eagerly brings us home, even though we once sought our freedom from him. And after judging the world with what the prophet describes as jealous anger, because God protects his own people, his own interest, God is to be worshipped alone. The very first command to have no other God in our life except the Lord God of Israel, the Lord God over all of creation. The Lord will save people. He saves you and me with sheer delight. Because on this day, the Lord rejoices in our presence as we gather with his purity. That's what we're going to discover this morning. That the Lord, and this is the thing that's, that blew me away this week in preparation for our time together, is that the Lord rejoices in our presence as we gather with his purity. Representing God during the reign of Josiah, that king who became a king when his father died, and he was only eight years of age, third grade, and he reigned for 30 plus years. During this time, in which people were coming back to the Lord and they rediscovered the truth of the Bible, the prophet Zephaniah captures the essence of what we will encounter on that massively monumental day, the day of the Lord. And just two words express the heart of authentic worship. What we will experience as worshipers and what God will express as the one being worshipped. And those two words are simply, 
pure joy. Because as the people of God, we are purified by the grace and the mercy of God. God sets us free from bondage as we have just sung this morning about resurrection power. And can it be that we should have freedom from sin and from death and from darkness? And so we have this purity. And as we worship God as this regathered community that are pure before him, God rejoices and he exclaims happiness and he communicates the sheer pleasure and this is what blows me away, of our presence with him. So Zephaniah, in the final chapter of a, of a time in which he speaks for God, one day of massive importance, he says that one day could be wrapped up in those two words, pure joy. Purified by the Lord, he will rejoice in your presence and mine. I am so thankful to Auntie Faith, our children minister, for doing so much preparation and homework to find videos and coloring books and resources, even word puzzles and things that can help you not only understand the prophets of what God delivered to us through these faithful men of God, but also how you can go deeper in discovering how one day Set apart as the Lord's day is a day that will prepare us for all eternity. And knowing that the Lord will rejoice over us forever means everything for us today. And that's what you're going to discover, boys and girls. And that's what we're going to talk about with our parents as well. So for the rest of us, I'd like to turn in our Bibles to the third chapter of Zephaniah. The third chapter of the prophecy of Zephaniah. In verses 1 to 8, we're going to see how our righteous Lord will extend his justice to us. God is not only interested in judging the world, but as Peter writes, judgment begins with the household of God, the family of God. Paul wrote to the Corinthian church and he says, hey, who are we to judge the world? We've got to judge ourselves first. And so sometimes it's of Christ, as believers in the Lord, it's easy to think that we're somehow immune. We have this herd immunity from God's judgment, but God will say that the righteous Lord will extend his judgment not only to the world, but also to us as his people. And then in verses 9 to 20, we're going to hear how our mighty Lord, and this is the thing that is absolutely life-changing and mind-blowing and jaw-dropping, is that our mighty Lord will exclaim, with joy over us. And so having just announced his impending judgment on the surrounding nations, people of Philistia and Moab and Ammon and Cush and Assyria, Zephaniah explains that God's covenant community, that the people of God are not immune from accountability. We haven't somehow earned a pass on God's examination of our life, but we are accountable to him. And we will see how our righteous Lord will extend his justice to us. Take a listen at verses 1 through 4. Woe to the city of oppressors, rebellious and defiled. She obeys no one. She accepts no correction. She does not trust in the Lord. She does not draw near to her God. Her officials... Within her are roaring lions. Her rulers are evening wolves who leave nothing for the morning. Her prophets are in principle. They are treacherous people. Her priests profane the sanctuary and do violence to the law. From the top to the bottom. From the everyday citizen in the marketplace and the community to the upper echelon of leadership and the governing powers of the city, the civic leadership, but also the spiritual leadership from top to bottom, every way that you could slice and dice the people of God. Zephaniah denounces the people of God for being corrupt, for being rebellious, and for being defiled. 
He alerts them to the imminent punishment if things don't change. And that's the whole idea behind a woe oracle. We hear the word woe and it's as if Zephaniah wants us to say woe. Because it was a funeral announcement. It was a, a word of, of, of lamentation, of, of grief, of loss, of mourning. And Zephaniah speaks to the people of God and says that you have been marked by oppression. That even though God has blessed you in so many ways, you still exploit others for your own gain. It's as if you can't get enough in your bank accounts, your purses, your pockets. You're still trying to squeeze every dime and every nickel out of people around you dishonestly and brutally. Rejecting the Lord's authority, they do whatever pleases them. They're a law unto themselves. They say that they are not accountable to anyone. They are rebellious. And not only that, but they're defiled. As a people of God, set apart, holy, a chosen people, they didn't live as a holy people, set apart, chosen by God, but they live just as polluted lives as those without the Lord as their God. Regardless of all that God had done for them, they were just doing as they pleased. And so wherever they walked, they defiled and they contaminated that environment. It's like they had spiritual body odor. Wherever they walked, it reeked. It was disastrous. And tragically, the people, the everyday citizen, the people in the marketplace, the everyday worker, they were simply following the leaders in the community. Like ferocious lions and ravenous wolves, Zephaniah says the governing rulers abuse their powers for their own advantage. They're not protecting the vulnerable. They're not fighting against injustice. They're not advocating for the weak. They're part of the problem. They're not marshalling solutions. They're making things worse. They're abusing the God-given trust given to them as governing leaders in the community. And it's one thing for political authorities and for governing powers to abuse their powers and their rights to be corrupt. And it's sad that sometimes we say they're one and the same, but there are godly leaders and there, there are God-fearing politicians. And so we don't want to lump them all together. But from a God-fearing perspective, we're not totally shocked. But Zephaniah says, it's not only the people in the marketplace, the civic leaders, but it's the spiritual men and women. It's the people that bear God-given responsibility that are there to speak for God like myself, that are there as a leader to represent people to God like your family members. If you were to check out our website, you'd check out the staff and the leadership. It's the faces that you see. It's the people that lead our small groups. It's the people that mentor us. And Zephaniah says, it's not just the people governing this community, but it's people that are directing the worship of God's people. That they lack integrity. That they disregard truth. And those who speak for God and those who speak on behalf of people to God, the prophets and the priests, they're actually just a bunch of crooks. They're in it for themselves. They're arrogant. They're narcissistic. They're self-absorbed. They're callous. They're heartless. And so it's one thing to look at the world and to say the leaders out there are corrupt, but it's another thing to look inside the sanctuary, the community of faith, and to say, what's with that? How could they be so messed up? They defile the place of worship and they break the law. And in sharp contrast, to the failed, reckless, and corrupt leaders, both out there as well as in here, the Lord is right and just. Take a listen to verse 5. The Lord within her is righteous. He does no wrong. 
It's a great definition of what it means that the Lord is righteous. He always does right. He does no wrong. Morning by morning, he dispenses his justice, and every new day, he does not fail, yet the unrighteous know no shame. As the righteous Lord who resides among his people in the temple, he does no wrong. He always does what is right. And so in contrast, whenever we fail to do what is right, whenever we are perpetrators of injustice or bystanders of discrimination, or if we are somehow actively doing what's evil, or if we somehow passively just keep to our own world and stay away from getting involved and disengage from that and just hope, like some hopelessly think the virus is just going to disappear, talk about the ultimate false truth, not false truth, something that's being marshaled as truth that's totally wrong. Justice just doesn't happen. But people have to advocate for the person of God to believe that he's righteous. And God says when that doesn't happen, God will hold us accountable. He holds you accountable. He holds me accountable for a lack of righteousness. If we neglect to do what is right, and fair. If we take advantage of others, if we abuse our authority, if we remain silent in the midst of evil, because the Lord will defend his honor. And we love Lamentations 3 because the Lord's mercies are new every morning. And I mean, you walk in the neighborhood, you wake up and you open your eyes and we thank God for the fresh outpouring of his mercies. And yet Zephaniah uses the exact same language as his contemporary Jeremiah. And he says, you know what? The mercies of God are not only new every morning, but guess what? The justice of God is new every single morning. Without fail, God meets out his justice. He displays his righteousness in fact, the way that Paul puts it in Romans 2, he stores up his wrath. It's not as if God turns a blind eye or turns away from evil in the world. Because in the same way that his mercies are freshly poured out to you and me, his justice and his righteousness, they are just as new every single day. Hearing the way that God is going to deal with the Assyrians, with the people of Moab and Ammon and the others that, that Zephaniah has just announced, that he has pronounced a woe upon in the preceding chapter, God thinks that would serve as a wake-up call, that it somehow would jar his people into repentance. In other words, God's thinking, man, if you see what I'm going to do to the, to the nations without me and how I'm going to pour out my wrath and justly punish them, don't you think that would have an effect on you as my people? Because judgment must begin with the people of God. Who are we to levy a sentence of God's punishment to the world if we don't recognize our own accountability to God? And so God imagines that the terror of his wrath would break through their rebellious wills and generate this substantial, genuine change within the lives of his people. But it doesn't. Take a look at verse 6. I have destroyed nations. Their strongholds are demolished. I've left the streets, their streets, deserted. It's a war zone. It's absolute decimation. An utter loss of human life. With no one passing through, their cities are laid waste. They are deserted and empty. I mean, <laughs> he's a great communicator. He says the same thing three ways. They are laid waste, they're deserted, and they're empty. And then this is what God imagines. Of Jerusalem, I thought, surely you will fear me and accept correction. And then her place of refuge would not be destroyed, nor all my punishments come upon her. 
And that's what God thinks, that, that his people, his chosen people, that Jerusalem would see the outpouring of his wrath, the devastation, the destruction, and somehow that would put the fear of God deep within their souls and that it would wake them up spiritually and it would generate this genuine breaking free from their rebellion and from their refusal to listen and from distancing themselves in the presence of God. And God says, if that would happen, then you would avert my punishment. Jerusalem would be okay. And I would retract the punishment that I threatened to bring upon you. But the second half of verse 7. But they were still eager. And literally, they got up early. You get up early to do things that you're excited about. But they got up early to act corruptly in all they did. Rather than stopping them in their tracks, breaking through their hearts and their wills, it actually propelled them. In other words, it didn't motivate them to do more evil. They just completely blew God off. And you might have a friend or maybe a classmate or you might even a family member who somehow they, they, they know the gospel and they've heard you speak the truth. They see it embodied in how you live your life and you actually cautiously, clearly warn them about the judgment of God, but they just go on doing what they want. And that's what God's own people are doing. They blow God off. And they even more so wake up early and in everything that they do, it's tainted with corruption. Therefore declares the Lord, wait for me, probably speaking to the remnant, to the faithful people of God, those that are, that is within the national judgment, there are some individuals who are still actually responding to God's word through the prophet and they're repenting of their rebellion and they're turning their way back to God, seeking his presence, listening to his voice, welcoming his correction. And he speaks to them and he speaks to us, wait for me, for the day I will stand up to testify. I have decided to assemble the nations, to gather the kingdoms, and to pour out my wrath on them, all my fierce anger. The whole world will be consumed by the fire of my jealous anger. Wow. Talk about not holding back. I mean, if you love someone, you speak the truth with crystal clarity. And Zephaniah, the one whose name means the Lord is hidden, reveals clearly how the Lord feels about rebellion. That the fire of his jealous anger will consume the whole world. And Zephaniah essentially says that he wants to be a student of history. He wants us to learn from the past. And one thing he wants us to pick up is that it's impossible. If you forget everything else, hold on to this. It is impossible to sin against God and to somehow escape his reckoning. It's impossible for me to think that I could sin and rebel and to compromise my integrity and somehow get away with it. It's impossible for you to ever imagine, you might delude yourself, but to ever imagine that you could do something that is in defiance of the will of God where you refuse his correction and somehow be okay. It's absolutely impossible. Whenever we slip into that mindset, we must take a careful look into what happens to anyone who dismisses their culpability and their accountability to God. Sirens are blaring. They are loud. I mean, I hear they're, they're going to Torrance Memorial, and it's as if in the providence of God, it sounds a signal of warning. Not to imagine that somehow we could get away with evil and rebellion against God. But the flip side is, if we acknowledge the inevitable consequences of either outright rebellion or hypocritical religion, 
then we will fear God and we'll get right with him. And when we see the judgment of God falling upon the world or people that, that choose to disobey God and they, they do something actually foolish and stupid and morally idiotic and we see the unraveling consequences of their rebellion, it's as if God says, hey, allow that to put the fear of God deep in your heart all the way down to the sole of your feet. so that you won't do the same thing, so that you will do what is right in the midst of temptation, so that you will choose righteousness over disobedience. What ancient Israel ignored, I've got to take to heart. What the people of God back then blew off, you've got to embrace in your life. So that means if there's something in your life, even this moment, that is a form of religious hypocrisy, maybe hidden sin, defiance, thinking that you can get away with it, by the authority of the prophet Zephaniah, he says, man, you can't get away with it. Because the Lord is righteous. The Lord is within us. He judges his people first. Because the righteous Lord will extend his justice to us. And as we wait for God's just mercy, we know that he will judge his people back through Babylon. But we also know that in the future, at the end of human history, Revelation chapters 6 through 19 paints this graphically horrific portrait, and yet beautifully wonderful image of God's righteous, just punishment of the world, that God will consume the whole world with his fierce anger. And knowing what God will do helps us to know what to do today. Ben Dunson is a Presbyterian minister outside of the city of Dallas, and he raises a question that many of us are raising today. We look at what's happening in the world, and he simply asks the question, is this the end? Is this it? I mean, are we at the end of human history? Should we say that COVID-19, worldwide civic unrest, and the international economic troubles we are facing today, are these God's judgment on the world? And he says the answer to that question depends on how we define the word judgment. Crises such as the coronavirus or racial divide or economic upheaval, they may not be specific judgments against specific people for specific sins, but neither are they near natural disasters. Because according to Revelation, Calamities like hurricanes, earthquakes, famines, and pandemics are indeed judgments for those outside of Christ, but they're limited. They're a wake-up call to a lost world, and they are a foretaste of the greater and final judgment still to come. For the believer, we see that even though we too must go through almost all of the exact same trials as unbelievers, these sufferings cannot separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. These trials come from the hand of God, who in the midst of them keeps his children close to himself. I have been learning so much through our study of the prophets. And I hope that you have been, become more comfortable, not only with this part of the Old Testament, but actually even more convicted with the message that these men of God have, are giving, not only back then historically, but what they continue to give to us in our generation. And as we tune in and, and synchronize our hearts with the message of the prophets, we have to become more conversant with the language of judgment. It's hard not to speak about the prophets and to deliver the message of the wrath and the justice and the righteousness of God. 
And knowing that we as God's chosen people are not immune or sheltered from the judgment of God, that our acts of disobedience will actually warrant his acts of discipline, we affirm that God will extend his justice to us. But that actually sets the stage for the flip side of this monumentally, massively important day of the Lord. When God acts on his behalf, his righteousness, and his mercy, and we'll see the sheer wonder and the remarkable sight that our mighty Lord will exclaim his joy over us. The righteous judgment of the Lord that punishes the entire world will purify his own people. Take a look at verses 9 through 13. Then I will purify the lips of the peoples, that all of them may call on the name of the Lord and serve him shoulder to shoulder. It's not just the lips of the people of God, but he will purify the lips of the peoples, that all of them may call together on the name of the Lord and serve him shoulder to shoulder, no physical distancing. Side by side, people by people, together collectively. From beyond the rivers of Cush, my worshipers, my scattered people will bring me offerings. On that day, the day of the Lord, you, Jerusalem, will not be put to shame for all the wrongs you've done to me because I will remove from you your arrogant boasters, no more problem people, no more people that defiled the land that you lived in. Never again will you be haughty on my holy hill, but I will leave within you the meek and the humble. The remnant of Israel will trust in the name of the Lord. They will do no wrong. They will tell no lies. There's a complete dramatic turnaround in the behavior and the heart of the people of God. A deceitful tongue will not be found in their mouths. They will eat and lie down, and no one, no one will make them afraid. You see, on one level, down the road, about a hundred years from now, under the leadership of the likes of Zerubbabel and Ezra and Nehemiah, the people of God will return and resettle into the land of Jerusalem, and they will re their walls and they will rebuild their temple. And so this once scattered, once disciplined people of God will be newly sanctified. They will be purified and they'll be shoulder to shoulder belonging to God in his, in his presence, worshiping God in his land. People who are humble and honest and trusting in him. And yet, on another longer-range level that is way beyond Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, the post-exilic prophets, and the people of God that helped them to resettle into the land of Jerusalem, way down into the end of human history, on the brink of eternity, the prophet anticipates when people after people after people Language after language after language from every tribe and every nation where we will be shoulder to shoulder in one collective voice, purified with lips, worshiping God with holy and humble hearts. You see, in God's final act of redemption, when everything is made new, when evil will become undone, when good will climactically and perfectly triumph once and for all, for all eternity, then our lips and our lives will be perfectly cleansed and aligned with others as we worship God. You see, ever since Genesis chapter 11, whenever someone comes up to me and tries to speak Mandarin, I say, Dushi, I can't speak Mandarin. 
Or if someone speaks Cantonese, I'll say, no, I'm sick of Dong And ever since Genesis chapter 11, if someone comes to you and speaks a language that is foreign to you that you don't understand, you'll look for a translator, you'll pull out your phones, you'll do a Google Translate, and you'll try to get as close to you can as possible to what they are saying. In fact, there's, a, there's an app called Babbel where we can learn a foreign language. And most people don't realize that, but that is a biblical app. I don't know if it's biblical in origin, but definitely the name. Because ever since Genesis chapter 11, scattering of the people of God, God judges the people of God who want to, to make a great name for themselves and don't want to disband. They want to somehow technologically and linguistically and in every sort of the way, establish their greatness. And God says, I'm going to judge you for that. And in Genesis chapter 11, he confuses their language, and then he disperses them. And what I love about Zephaniah chapter 3 is there is a reversal of the curse. Those that were scattered or gathered together, those that, that don't understand each other in the United Nations, in our three congregations, those that appreciate the ministry of a Wycliffe because of the value of putting the Bible in a language that they understand that all of these things will be obsolete in the kingdom of God. Because God will purify our lips, will give us a common language. With one voice, linguistically, many peoples, ethnically, gathering together, worshiping God with holy and humble hearts. And with this staggering, mind-blowing portrait of a once scattered people who spoke countless languages God says, I'm going to join you together to worship me. And it's an incredible reversal of the curse that we've been living with almost ever since the beginning of humanity. No longer driven by a prideful, shared ambition to make a name for ourselves that huddles together with his pride-filled ambition, God purifies our lips and our lives. We are totally safe, absolutely secure. No fear or suspicion or concern over one another, either within our nation or even internationally. Because God will have removed all the barriers as we worship him. In the final section of our chapter and of his prophecy, I love the way that Zephaniah captures the mutual two-way delight that we enjoy with the Lord. This is our delight with God we're really accustomed to. 14. Sing, daughter Zion. Shout aloud, Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart, daughter Jerusalem. We're used to that. Sing, shout aloud, be glad and rejoice with all of your heart. And then the reason why, the Lord has taken away your punishment. He has turned back your enemy. The Lord, the King of Israel, is with you. Never again will you fear any harm. There's no apprehension about judgment or loss of divine real estate. We will forever be in the presence of God. We could shout aloud and sing and delight ourselves fully in his presence. Talk about total security, complete freedom. On that day, 16, on that day, they will say to Jerusalem, do not fear Zion. Do not let your hands hang limp. There's no cause for anxiety. No reason for despair, but every reason to jump and to shout and to declare our satisfaction and our gladness in the presence of God. Forgiven, delivered, 
forever with him. But then this is where Zephaniah turns our whole worldview upside down with his final image. Take a look at 17 to the end. The Lord, your God, is with you. The mighty warrior who saves. And this is what blows me away. He will take great delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. I will remove from you all who mourn over the loss of your appointed festivals, which is a burden and reproach for you. No one to spoil the joy that God has with his people in his presence. At that time, I will deal with all who oppressed you. I will rescue the lame. I will gather the exiles. I will give them praise and honor in every land where they have suffered shame. At that time, I will gather you. At that time, I will bring you home. Isn't that a beautiful image? I will give you honor and praise among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your very eyes, says the Lord. I just I can't get over this passage because Zephaniah's finishing touch on his portrait of God on the day that is massively, monumentally significant is that the Lord takes exceptional delight. He shows enthusiastic joy in your presence and mine. And so we're used to this whole idea of rejoicing in God and delighting in his presence and finding and shouting aloud before him because of the praise that we feel for what God does in our lives. But I don't hear and I don't realize until Zephaniah drives the beauty of this truth home to us as the exclamation mark of his day. That it's a day in which God sings over you with joy. He rejoices over you with singing. And I think of a mom or dad who just can't exude enough joy and happiness in the presence of their child. And there are times when we wonder, God, do you love me? God, are you with me? God, are you advocating for me? God, do you see what's happening in the world? And God says, I see and I am just and I am mighty. And I can't wait for that day. Because you will shout, you will be glad, you will sing. But not only that, but I will sing over you and I will be glad over you. And I will, and I will sing God singing. Our vision of worship is usually the angels and the people of God singing. But God himself will sing. I can't wait for that to happen. I don't know if he's baritone or bass or soprano or alto. But God is going to have this incredible exclamation of gladness over you and over us as the people of God. He's a pastor in Cincinnati. And he immigrated with his family from China to the Midwest. And he talks about, in light of Independence Day, where he pledges his ultimate allegiance. Ryan Sang says, shortly after my family immigrated to America in 1999, my uncle handed me a history of the United States written in Chinese. Don't you love that? I gobbled the book in two weeks, immediately captivated by the personalities and idealism behind America's founding. My fascination grew into an obsession with American presidents, politics, and John Adams. In college, he went to Georgetown University. I picked American studies as my major. And he says, I was proud to say that I knew more about American history than even my American friends in high school and in college. But I was even prouder when my parents and I took our oaths to become American citizens in 2005. And this is what he writes. 
when I took my citizenship oath in the summer of 2005, I renounced my fidelity to any foreign sovereignty and pledged my allegiance to the Constitution of the United States of America. But I must admit that at best I can only be a subversive patriot. Not because I'm looking for opportunities to betray my country, but because I have been called into the kingdom of God every day of my life when I see injustice, violence, evil, sickness. I will pray that the people of this kingdom will be a light in darkness and that the glory and authority of our king will soon be established in our world. You see, that day when our king will inaugurate his perfect rule over the whole world is the day that we all eagerly await. When God will deal with the wicked and God will lift up the righteous. And that day of the Lord prepares us for eternity in his presence. What our just and our strong God does for us is way beyond our wildest dreams. Because on that day, the Lord rejoices in our presence as we gather with his purity. And that day forever will be pure joy. Let's pray together. Father, that is the day. It is your day that we look forward to. A day that we will see that you are the righteous God who takes care of evil and lifts up the godly. But you are also the mighty God who loves worship. And even as we sing and shout and rejoice in your presence, God, you are the one who will sing even louder. You will look over us with joy. And forever, we will experience what you have designed us for. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.